Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to episode 93 of Diffused Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. You're joining myself, Omar Ansari, as well as my co-host and the founder of the show, Prabhupada Zahman. Today, we're blessed to be joined by Sheikh Faraz Rabani, who's based in Toronto. So you could call this this episode the North American Muslim Experience. So we're, we're branching out. But we're really honored to have Sheikh Faraz here. We're going to be talking about a bunch of stuff, um, focusing on Ramadan, which is a couple days away, and uh, navigating through Ramadan in this very unique environment, the, the, the 2020 coronavirus crisis, and, and how to navigate through Ramadan amongst, uh, amidst all that that's going on. So welcome, uh, Sheikh Faraz. Jazakum uh, khair. Um, I'm a you know, big fan of of diffuse congruence right from its in, inception, and uh, it's it's a real honor to be here. Uh, it's one of the most interesting podcasts that I, you know that, that I that I that I listen to. Uh, I, have a check, I have a list of podcasts I wish were weekly, and, <laughs> and this is one of them. But alhamdulillah. And and Barbez, please please uh, if you wouldn't mind, give us a little background on Chef absolutely um, um, yeah, it, directly. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Omar and uh, Chef Faraz. We are honored. And I, I know you are a longtime listener and you've been kind enough to um, share our previous episodes and, and comment on them. So we're always very grateful um, to have uh, people listen. Uh, and then especially uh, someone, uh, you know, like at Illuminary, such as yourself, listening to the show. So we're deeply humbled and honored and flattered and all of the above at the same time. So um, Chef Faraz, um, uh, probably doesn't need an introduction for, for a lot of our listeners, but uh, he spent 10 years studying with some of the leading scholars of our time, first in Damascus and then in Amman, Jordan. Um, he studied with some of the foremost theologians and Hanafi scholars uh, of our age. Um, after st uh, spending several years abroad, he returned to Canada in the year 2007, uh, where he founded Seekers Hub um, in order to meet the urgent need and spread Islamic information book on online as well as sort of on, on the ground, brick and mortar um, uh, content providing as well. He's the author of Absolute Essentials of Islam, Faith, Prayer, uh, and, the pa and the Path of Salvation, excuse me, uh, according to the Hanafi School. So um, again, deeply honored, Chef for us to have you uh, join the show. And as we often like to do, and as a listener, I imagine um, you've heard us say this or asked this countless times, which is, We'd love to talk a little bit about your um, origin story, um, although we'll promise to sort of uh, keep this as sort of a tease to perhaps have you on to uh, expound on that. But to maybe just quickly for those who are listening, um, tell us a little bit about your background, your sort of origin story, as it were. Yeah. Um, no, Bismillah. Really, I, I sort of consider myself like a like a global nomad or like a Bedouin. Because um, I, I was born in Karachi, but never actually lived there. Um, when I, I was less than a year old, when my when my parents uh, traveled, and I usually get the order wrong. So they went to the the Emirates, and they went to Canada, then they went to Cairo, and we went all over the place, and we're in England for a while, and then you know moved to different countries, and then did most of my high school in Spain actually. Um, and then I was pretty set from Spain. Like my life trajectory was I wanted to go to Oxford University because my life idol was Imran Khan. My whole wall was just, it's embarrassing now, but it was just Imran Khan posters. So like I, on principle, refused to go to visit Cambridge University because we used to have a house in, in England. So I refused. Like the family went, I stayed home in Northwest London because I'm not going to go to Cambridge. That's, you know, which is silly, but, um, the, referring to the critique uh, so the first year now prime minister, correct? <laughs> yeah. So I have to like, you know, I have to sort of separate my childhood admiration of, of Imran Khan with him as prime minister. But from there, um, you know, we, we came back to Canada. And so I did my last year of high school in Canada. And, but, it, but coming back to, to Canada was a big shock because I was already in Spain wondering like, what exactly is my identity? Who am I? Am I Pakistani? We used to go every summer, but Pakistan was like a vacation place. 
it, Spain doesn't really have the notion of being an immigrant and becoming integrated or assimilated, really. You're still a, just a foreigner. Mm -hmm. and I never thought of myself as Spanish. I used to go to England every summer, but I was I wasn't British, even you know, and actually am I. Um and try to read more about Pakistan and Jinnah. Said maybe I'm Indian. That's a question I still haven't resolved. Am I Pakistani or Indian? But um the sustainable answer was that really, you know, the at the core of my identity and my reality is that I'm I'm a believer. Um and that got me uh, interested in learning. Um, I wanted to just pack up and go off somewhere as exotic as possible to study. But alhamdulillah, one of those old world values that one learns from parents and others is consult. And sadly, everybody I'd consult would say, finish your university. Mm -hmm. I'd go ask someone else, like, can I just drop my university and go and say, no, finish your university. And that's a big blessing, alhamdulillah, because it ended up being of, of great benefit. So after finishing university, uh, largely majoring in coffee and, <laughs> and, and you know, and, recreational and, activities. Yeah, yeah, coffee and change the world kind of thinking. Um, uh, mastered the art of the, the slackers be. Like, how can you get through university without any effort? Right? Um, alhamdulillah, the plan worked out. Um, my wife and I went to uh, to Damascus to study. Last year, university, I I got married, which I didn't think was possible because why would anyone be crazy enough <laughs> to leave North America and go? At that time, I was thinking of going to Sudan because mm. Sheikh Abdullah Idris, former mm. head of ISNA, was here in Toronto. So, but I just announced it. Right? I mean, I made I'd done theater in in high school, uh, and did some theater. Thank God this is before the age of internet, <laughs> early 90s, just before the internet. Yeah. So my, my, you know, my acting and also my, I was, I was arts editor for our campus newspaper. None of that is online. Thank God. <laughs> um, not, not that anything of it was like fundamentally wrong or anything. It was just embarrassing. Um, yeah. So, I just declared nobody's ever going to marry me because A, B, and C, but found someone c crazy enough to also want to marry, and we uh, headed to Damascus and then you know, pursued the path of knowledge mm -hmm. um, more formally. So, uh, I'm, again, you don't have to date yourself, but I imagine this is the mid-90s or early 90s? Is, it, is this the era we're talking about? Because you mentioned yeah. Sheikh Abdul Adri, so I'm kind of you know, uh, lining yeah, up so, with my trajectory. So I, I went to university in 1992, Okay. So, yeah, so we're very much into sort of activist Islam. Yeah. And uh, there's, you know, there's this peak of real hyperactivity and so on. Okay. And, um, but then we hit this after sort of the third year of university, we're all wondering, like, what the heck is going on, right? Because, you know, there's all, we're doing all this stuff, but we're feeling really empty within, right? And then there's also a lot of other disturbing things, a lot of the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. It was as if, like, okay, uh, you know, I've lived overseas everywhere, but I'm not Egyptian, I'm not Pakistani, I'm not, like, what What do these struggles have to do with where I am right now? Yeah. Right? So that was a big question mark. Um, and and at the same time, and sort of this, this is like a lot of people who come on your show, like, then we're here, and you know, a lot of things were distressing. So we, a bunch of us, we dabbled in a whole slew of things. Uh, Nadir Khan, my my good friend, you know, um, you know former guest of the show. show. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep. That's right. And so a lot of us, you know, we'd we'd have these big questions and so on, and really turned off by many things, and um, that we are seeing that of sort of just foreign Islam, right? Of yeah. all this political activism, but how does it relate to where we are? And then these voices were emerging, which we looked at with great, initially great skepticism, a little bit of scorn initially that what a bunch, <laughs> sorry, like, felt like they're, what a bunch of weirdos. Like, what are they talking about? Especially because we're also influenced by some sort of very literalist Islam. Yeah. So th there's this Californian hippie that we hear about called Hamza Yusuf. That's right. I call Imam Hamza. That's right. Where did he come from? Throw your TVs away? 
But it was, it, it seemed radical enough yeah. to sort of catch our attention. But then we couldn't understand what he was talking about. And then there's other figures, also intriguing, but they're strange enough that they really caught our attention. Sheikh Abdul, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, Sheikh mm-hmm. Muh Keller, others. We got these good, we got these cassettes from oh, yeah. this imam in, in, from New Haven, Connecticut called Zaid Shakir. And then we hear he's gone to Damascus. What? And so it was really strange. So there's all these influences. So we started investigating about traditional Islam, but initially quite skeptically. Um, and there, you know, went to a deen intensive, stayed at the Masjid al Islam in '95. Wow. And your know, Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad was there, Sheikh Hamza was there, others, you know. We were weird. I mean, it was transformative, but we're still kind of skeptical. But but it it increasingly made it made more sense. And then locally, we connected with a with a, a you know a, a Lebanese teacher who's now actually at Zaytuna, uh, uh, Sheikh Talal Ahdab. Oh yes, he's, he's a, so we thought that there's this really unique guy, beautiful character, very polite. But we just knew he sold books. But then we discovered that, you know what? He's actually <laughs> deeply learned. So we started, you know, in a study circle with him. And that was a transformative experience, not just in terms of the, the teaching, and which was, you know, that was very basic. It was just to learn how to pray and what we believe and so on. But just the approach, That's right. not just paradigm. religion, but also, right. yeah. The, the paradigm, but also you could see the impact mm. of a very clear approach to religion in his own conduct. That's right. right? And, and what struck me was, you know, was that this is very livable, right? This is very livable. You know, Sheikh Talal was at that time a computer engineer and very successful one at that. But what he was teaching us, even though he's, a, he was, you know, he's Lebanese Canadian, He's a foreigner, but I could fully see myself as by then considering myself a Cana- you know, Pakistani Canadian Muslim or Canadian. Mm-hmm. I could see myself practicing this. I don't need to put on a thobe and look foreign and say ya akhi and you know whatever. Like it seemed very just normal, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and can very, I ask you a quick question? Yeah. So it sounds like you. You you ended college, the university experience in Toronto, with a pretty clear understanding of how you wanted to approach your faith, and in fact, you were even you said married. Was this was this something that happened because of the college experience? And you got involved with the right crowd, or I'm just trying to understand that transformation from when you arrived in Canada as a 12th grader, 11th grader, um, and then how you ended up in a, a matter of five years with with that level of interest in, in per- pursuing your studies in Islam further. I'm um, just really curious about that. Yes, yeah, so I mean, I've always been, uh, I've always been a reader, and um, that's one of the annoying things. Like parents do all these annoying things, and later, especially when you reach uncle age, you realize, you know what? My dad was smarter than I thought. So one of the annoying things growing up, always, whenever I'd want a, a toy or a gift or whatever, my dad would say, "Let's go get get some books." And I threw. I've thrown international tantrums, I recall, in Cairo, in London, in Madrid, Karachi, all over. I said, no, I don't want, I don't want books. I want a bike. Right. And he'd get me a bike, would make me wait, which itself has merits because you learn. Um, and then I tried to go, she said, okay, I'll get some books. But can I get a, like, I tried to sort of like flip the narrative, but, um, but he always inculcated this love of reading, um, of approaching things thoughtfully. Um, so I had this this crisis, and you know, so spent a lot of time reading, thinking, having these deep con- conversations. It was involved in a whole slew of different, com- you know, different student groups and so on. Made a lot of people cry, which kind of scared me because I don't like making people sad. But you know, I'd raise an issue like, okay. You have you ever thought about what's going to happen when we die, at the campus paper, <laughs> and, and got two people crying? So why are you guys crying? Because 
never thought about death. I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't know. I had to change the topic. So why don't we go grab pizza? Don't want to be a buzzkill. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but but then you, you know, and then alhamdulillah connected with, with you know, with, you know, good company. We were blessed at the University of Toronto to have Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick. Yes. He was doing his master's and then PhD at the University of Toronto on Usman Danfodio. One of the, yeah. um, and for me, the biggest impact always wasn't what people taught about, about Islam. Mm -hmm. right? Like first year, I was, you know, sort of, there's a term ABCD, uh, basically, you know, what they say, you know, it's American born confused Desi. Mm -hmm. It was also like a basically confused Desi, right? <laughs> so I was trying to figure out who am I? And at that time, the Muslim Student Association was run by some pretty tough literalist, mm. um, you know, overly keen people. So yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd yeah. Fit, feel very judged. <laughs> Every time I'd go to, to anything to do with the MSA, even the prayer hall, I'd feel like so deficient, like such yeah, a loser. That's right. So it was, it was quite a traumatic experience. But then there's this man. I didn't talk to him for months. He would be walking around campus with this, you know, like I, I wanted to be like that man, not to say dress like him, but just he carried himself with so much dignity, so much nobility, so much grace. And this is the way he, so I started stalking Sheikh Abdullah Kiyu quick. I just noticed how he'd be so gracious when he was buying his coffee, just dealing with the librarian. I'd be like, wow. And so that really got me thinking. And that was one of the things that really you know, made me think that any sound understanding of religion should affect how you are as a person. Because, you know, I was trying to connect with the religion and, you know, alhamdulillah, my, you know, my parents had inculcated that in our household. But a lot of the things I was seeing, see, there seemed to be disconnect. And they're talking about be more religious, but it's making you a worse person. Mm-hmm. So that that was one of the big questions um, that you know sort of alhamdulillah that helped guide sort of you know that really whatever you believe should affect how you are mm -hmm. right and if, um, and alhamdulillah we we had you know a good group of of students at at the on campus uh, um, some of them who've gone on to become you know very capable activists. Um, like Abdurrahman Malik, who was with Radical Middle Way, and now he's at Yale, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and and others, um, Nadir Khan, bunch of others. Um, so you know, so that, uh, and we we you know we all had this common realization. So from second year of university, we're paying attention to learning the religion, etc. But we were deeply dissatisfied that what we were finding was was not. You know, it seemed alien to where we were at, you know, in you know, in in our life circumstances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I mean, just hearing you talk and just sharing your experiences bring back so many. Um, I mean, I see so many parallels with my own sort of life and um, coming of age in that in that era or period of the uh, activist uh, Islam and. And, and not only some of the people you've mentioned, but uh, others that are that haven't been mentioned. But um, j it just makes me want to have you back on the show to sort of delve into that on a on a much more deeper level. And well, I think I think we, we'd, we'd have a great conversation about that because I think I'd love to hear your um, not only being Canadian, but also um, where where you find yourself now in terms of being you know like on the on the, on the academic scholarly uh, end of it, uh, but sort of beginning with being infused with that sort of ideological activist, um, perhaps even literalist frame uh, at the MSA. So I, I'd love to have you back to, to, to get into that. Um, um, this is probably going to be a difficult shift, but I think um, what I, 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 I want to come back to some very, very practical elements of this, of this conversation, but perhaps to sort of back up and maybe present it in a theoretical sense. Um, you know, when we talk about you know, obviously, we 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 we, we, we want to talk about Ramadan, but before delving into Ramadan directly, um, I, I sort of wanted to pick your brain, as it were, with regards to how we frame ibadah or worship um, holistically in, in Islam, and and by that I mean, you know, so 
you know, often people will ask, you know, like the existential question or the, um, uh, yeah, the, the sort of fundamental question of why we do something. So why do we pray or why do we fast? Um, and so I, I always sort of frame it this way, which is, you know, there's an ontological or metaphysical reason for why we do the things that we do. So why do we pray or why do we fast? Well, we do so because Allah commands us. So that's sort of the ontological or metaphysical reasons for why we do the things that we um, do with regards to ibadah. But out of Allah's uh, fadl and his mercy and his grace upon us, um, you know, there are intrinsic values and benefits um, that we can accrue uh, through uh, the, mod the various modalities of ibadah, such as fa fasting or prayer or charity and so on. Um, and, and those I sort of then further divide into two categories. Um, and I promise I'm going to, I don't want this to be a sermon, but I'd love to sort of get your thoughts because we have you on the show. Um, so then further dividing that into sort of two values or benefits that we, that out of Allah's mercy and grace that we are able to accrue by way of obeying him, right? Obeying the, uh, the command of praying or fasting. Um, those are uh, what I like to call metaphysical or eschatological benefits, um, i.e. benefits that we accrue in the afterlife, uh, which may or may not be uh, discernible in our lifetimes or in this present life. But nonetheless, we are rest assured that we will be rewarded in the life hereafter. And, and then number two, uh, and more, ten more related to this worldly life and existence, is what I like to call utilitarian value and benefits. So, for example, if we're talking particularly about fasting, you know, there's the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says that, you know, fasting is with God. Fasting is with Allah. Allah retains the value that fasting, that the, fa that the person observing the fast will have. And that, that accruement or that benefit will be, will be seen in, on the Day of Judgment. But then there are certain utilitarian values and benefits of fasting as well, right? We can't uh, deny the fact that fasting, intermittent fasting now, medically is shown to have health benefits and so on. And, and, and also fasting uh, allows us to reflect upon those who are uh, less fortunate than us and so on and so forth. So um, I, I'd love to sort of get your thoughts on that entire sort of frame, as it were. And then, you know, I'll leave it to you to sort of uh, take us into maybe Ramadan and fasting in particular. Yeah, I've always been really lazy, right? Like my, my mother's been always convinced that, you know, unless she sort of applied chappal therapy, I'd never <laughs> get out of bed, right? In that, you know, but, you know, like, I always thought, like, if you don't have to do something, don't do it, right? Um, and manage to sort of skate through life, <laughs> managing approach. to do that. <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, I'm always a little rebellious at heart. You know, parents tell you to do all these things. Um, I learned really quickly that, you know, there's a s certain amount of upsetting your parents that was strat strategically advantageous, right? Which is when you annoy them enough that they get upset with you. I had really good parents. So if I did annoy them, they'd be apologetic. I'd get a treat, whatever. So I learned uh, sort of, you know, what I, you could call parentology, how to, you know, to understand the sociology of parents. I'm, I'm going um, to I'm gonna have to censor this episode for my kids now after that. You gave that yeah. trick away. <laughs> yeah. No, so, you know, <laughs> the, the, but, so, then, you know, when I started getting more serious, so growing up, you know, like my grandmother would try to, convince me to memorize some surahs of Quran. And I still like, when I read surah at surah Atin, I get teary-eyed because my grandmother struggled really hard to get me to memorize surah Atin. And I wouldn't say because it sounds just like surah Al-Asr because there's half a verse that is shared. He says, no, it's different. I said, no, it's the same. <laughs> and I just go away. So you have to like, so I want to know why something um, you know, like, why is it this way right. for it to make sense to me? Not because mm. I was necessarily being rebellious, but it had to make sense. Mm. But a lot of the presentations of Islam, that, that's one of the things that would shake me. That why? Okay. Uh, why is it this way? Like, okay, why does Allah want us to worship Him? Does He need us to worship Him? Right? So there'd be a lot of questions. And many of the responses would not just be dissatisfying, would be deeply troubling. Mm -hmm. Right? 
uh, one of them in a book called Let Us Be Muslims, that basic, basically all our worship is military training. And I'm lazy. I'm like, you know, I'm not about to get into any <laughs> kind of military thing because just it's too much hard work. Like that's right. like, like boot camp. Like our religion is like boot camp. That's yeah. awful. It's right? awful like, metaphor. Yeah, or not even metaphor. Right. It's literal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was deeply disturbing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And especially when you read the life of the Prophet, he doesn't seem like a an angry military man, right? It's like, what's going on? So that that was one of the things that. There's a deep dissatisfaction and where a lot of this address where, you know, like the, the way you beautifully presented sort of understanding the the underlying reality behind what we do and, you know, which then shows you why we do it, but also then how it plays out in our lives, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, because it, it, you know, one, you know, that the truth should affect you at, at every level, not just rationally, but how does this affect how how I am with with someone else? That's right. Um, and 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 that's sort of the, the you know the, the sort of the complete balance that the fast fasting. There's a metaphysical dimension to the fasting, right? But there's also a dimension of the fasting that that you sit with your with your with your neighbor, whether they're a Muslim or a non-Muslim, right? That you share that you share food with others, right? So that that completeness has always really appealed to me, right? Um, both, both from the, the the idea that fasting is about the about realizing Allah's closeness, right? That if you, and the culmination of the verses of fasting, that if my servants ask you regarding me, I am indeed near. I answer the call of those who call upon me when they call. So let them answer my call and let them truly believe in me, so that they may return. But at the other side, the you know the, this the, this beautiful social and economic aspect of the fasting, not just at the big picture level of giving charity and so on, but just being with other human beings, right? About th th those little acts of of caring and you know, and and so on, which so many people are you know, feel like they're missing or going to miss now that we're approaching Ramadan, right? Um, because that that aspect is beautifully manifest as well, right? The, mm -hmm. the sort of the, the practical social elements of, of our religion, um, which make many, which really sometimes we neglect to just you know be Muslims, you know, in a balanced way with those who are around us. I was j just did the nikah of a, of the the son of of a friend from university made me feel really old because I was there when this, this guy, this kid was born. Um, and, you know, and my friend became Muslim without knowing anything about Islam. He just saw these Muslims who were just being normal, right? But it's so beautiful, right? That they would share food with each other. They would just come up and tell somebody to join them for a meal, and then Ramadan came, and my friend was like, his his neighbors, they're they're sharing an like a an, an apart a, a, a townhouse. He was in the basement; they're on the ground floor, and they just send over food, right? And that's the religious act, right? You know, sharing food with others. He said, join us for a meal. He said, don't these guys care about their budget? Because everyone's broke when you're at university, and and that's you know that's deeply that's you know that 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 balance. We're not just a religion of, of theory, but there is an intellectual and uh, philosophical and and spiritual grounding. But it's there in our you know in, in the even the, in the smallest things in our lives, right? Um, so so that's you know for for me and the fast sort of expresses all of that, right? I, I physically, but also in these in, in these little things. Um, and you, were, you're t you touched on a bunch of really those sweet moments in Ramadan, right? The sharing of the food, inviting your neighbors, Muslim, non-Muslim neighbors over, uh, people engaging you for the first time that maybe never did to talk about your religion because you're not eating, all those really nice things. And we're going to miss those this year. Um, 
we're going to miss, we're going to miss those moments at work where you get the chance to talk a little about your faith comfortably for the first time. We're going to miss, um, breaking fast with neighbors. Um, it's, it's going to, it's not going to be the same. And, and I have a 13 year old, um, who's, well, she just turned 13 and child, this is her first full Ramadan. And all year I've been thinking about how to make it special. And, and of course it's totally different now, right? We have to kind of improvise. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that? And any, 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 I'll take any tips and got and, and help in terms of how to make it special. But what are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. So we step back a little bit, you know, before I hit 40, I, I was, I always sort of pegged 40 as being when you reach uncle stage, right? So I, I, you know, I was like, once you're 40, you're an uncle. But then I was 37. I was like, yikes, I'm becoming an uncle soon. So I said, before anyone calls me uncle, I'm going to call myself uncle. So I made a Twitter handle called Uncle Rabani, which is now largely passive, but sort of he's the grumpy uncle who sort of says foolish or wise things. Um, you know, your love for her should not go down when her weight goes up. <laughs> Life is like Ladoo. Uh, so the, but when you hit uncle age, you also get uncle kind of you know, health conditions and so on. So a number of years ago, I stopped being able to fast for, for, for a couple of years, right? And it was a very jarring experience because suddenly I can't fast. Yeah. Um, and, and similarly, actually, for a couple of years, because I had some, some, some eye trouble, I couldn't pray Tarawih because it was <laughs> a danger to my sight. Uh, the doctor said, you can absolutely not be in bowing position, let alone prostration. Wow. So I'd be actually at our own se learning center. <laughs> so we, pr I'd pray a shout with the congregation, then I'd go into my room. Right? And you feel like a bit of a slacker or whatever, but you're just doing what you medically have to do. Um, but, um, but that's where, you know, and this year too, like, alhamdulillah, you know, we have iftar every single day, you know, with a large, you know, a large community. We have to sort of extricate ourselves from that because, you know, at the center we have daily co communal iftars where we go visit family or the family just comes to the center. So it's a very social um, in the iftar. But, but the thing is, one of the, I think one of the great mercies of situations like this is that Allah SWT reminds us of His mercy, right? Right? In that very often what Allah grants us when He, when, he withholds is greater than what he grants us when he gives. And many of the great sages of Islam have talked about that, right? That um, in these moments, you, you know, I have, I have four children, right? From the older ones are, are they're sort of self, you know, they manage themselves 18 and 16. But I have a 14 year old daughter and now a three year, three, three year old daughter. And she's very curious, you know, like she just says, Corona is bagu. Bagu means it's bad, right? But she's curious, right? Like, what's going on? Because now she can't go outside much, whatever. And you know, even the older, the fourteen-year-old, the she's a bit, you know, like, what do I go home all day, right? Um, and they're they're handling it. But one of the things is just appreciating the the, the you know the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right? That Allah does not reward, like you know. Allah is not, there's no name called the great accountant, right? That we do a hundred things and he'll give us thousands of rewards and that's it. Ultimately, it's about, you know, the, the two greatest values to embrace is, you know, is love and, and, and mercy, right? That we appreciate the, and sometimes the stepping back makes us appreciate all that we have been blessed with anyways, right? That rather than see it as we've lost out on these things, to have gratitude that the very fact that these things are in our lives, right? That the fact that we have family, the fact that we have friends, the fact that we have community, the fact that we have society, that we have all these things is to look at it with gratitude, right? And sometimes being forced to step away from it, you know, the, the, the response is to look at it with gratitude, right? And to inculcate that in our, and then also to appreciate what we do have, right? I, you know, I live, you know, like not everybody has a hectic life. I've been home so much more with the kids um, that you know you appreciate those moments, right? 
uh, with my, you know, with with the little one and so on. So that's one of the things. It's not to, you know, that we're dealing with the most generous, right? So not to f fret about what we're missing out on, but to, to look at those opportunities. But now we're home a lot more, etc. So you know, like my daughter comes as Abuji. I want to listen to Yahanana, her famous Nasheed. So we're watching Yahanana. I said, okay, Abuji, you read and I'll read. I said, okay, let's sit down. So I'm reading, she's reading. So what are you reading? And, you know, so you get that extra time, you know, with the kids. So we beautify it in the ways that, that we can, right? Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the main things is that Allah teaches us that we don't approach things on our terms, but to appreciate what he's sending us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's one of the lessons you learn when you experience any kind of health condition, right? That it's not about, like I can, you know, for me, the, the best Ramadans have been these Ramadan were several of these Ramadans when I didn't fast, I didn't, I didn't do Taraweeh in congregation, I couldn't even read the Quran, right? Because I was legally blind for a while, right? But, you know, how you respond to it, you appreciate it's from Allah, right? And there's great merit in it. So, you know, yeah. so what you can do, you embrace that. So, alhamdulillah. Yeah, that, um, that's, uh, that's great advice. Yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's profound. It, it's, it's, I could see this as, oh man, it's a challenging month or, or inshallah, it'll be something we, we maybe remember for a long time about that really, really special Ramadan where we got to spend more time with our immediate family. And have more dinners at home together with the immediate family and so on and so forth. So that's, I think that's a great advice to look at the glass and half full and what's the opportunity and then trust that God's going to give us something better. But it's not just half full, right? The, the thing is, the, the reality is that the glass is always full, right? Yeah. Right? Because, you know, as what one of the poets said that, you know, the, that creation is but a cup for, for you know, for the meanings of divine oneness, right? So in that sense, the cup is always full, right? Because Allah is always giving us, right? It's just a question of what's the nature of the gift, right? Mm. Um, and, you know, and we appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just... And the first person who's, like, that's, I'm, 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 I'm a sort of positive person by nature. I had Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah stay at my place. And you just, alhamdulillah, you know, I'm sort of, positive by nature. Dr. Rabbi just looks at me and says that we should appreciate God in the in the blows of his majesty as we appreciate him in his in his gracious gifts. I'm like <laughs> I'm thinking to that I don't want no blows of majesty, right? That was just a couple of years before my health condition started, but it was it was profound. So I was thinking, you know, thinking about it and I'm like so, you know, you know the, these these situations, I think, you know, we should just, you know, of course, th there are things that we re regret missing out on and so on, but rather we should really look at everything that we have, right? Everything that we have. And, you know, one of the amazing things about our beloved Prophet Sallallahu is that he looked, you know, uh, at creation as if it's with childish wonder, right? And the Prophet would be amazed at little things, right? He taught us all that it, when the first rain fall occurs, that to go outside and let some of the rain fall directly on your chest to appreciate the rain, to appreciate the thunder, to appreciate, you know, once the Prophet was eating dry bread and dipping it in the leftover of the vinegar. And his companions were sitting around him. They, they had nothing else to present the Prophet Stale bread that he could only dip in the leftover dross of the vinegar. And he just smiled and said, what a wonderful sauce is vinegar. And the Arabs actually didn't call that leftover vinegar. They had other names for it rather than calling it vinegar. Right? Wow. So, so that's, that's the thing. That's easy to say, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have this, I'm losing this. But in all of this, you know, I think that, you know, I think one of the biggest things is just to nurture gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, one of the favorite hadiths of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, um, and the interesting thing is, I discovered, I don't know how I overlooked it. I was like, oh my God, I've taught this hadith so many times, 
Now I realize, oh my God, I missed the, the last part of the explanation, which is the kid didn't actually die, which was his granddaughter was brought to, to him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the granddaughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he held her against his own chest, and she died. Turns out that she actually didn't die. It seemed that she died. And that's where you know, sometimes you have to read things carefully in Arabic. I have to admit, I, I messed up on this for several years. The hadith says she died. But it was only that the people present thought she died. She lived on, actually. So she died against his chest. Um, uh, um Ayman, who would also raise the Prophet ﷺ, started crying out loud. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Um Ayman, what is this crying? So she looked at the Prophet ﷺ and said, and she saw he had tears coming down his cheeks. She said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, do I not see you cry? He said, this is not crying. Even though he had tears coming down his cheeks, he said, it is just mercy. And then he said, it said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the believer is in all good in every state. Even when the believer is facing death, they're content and praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Right? So, that's, you know, and, and that's part of it, that in any state, if we just pause and see, okay, what, what has Allah sent me, right? There is, you know, and it's not just things to be grateful about, right? It's the idea of we have life, right? We have life. And that itself, if we thought about how, what a spectacular gift to be alive is, I'd rather be alive than be a rock, right? That, you know... I can think, I can feel, I can choose. So, you know, and I think inculcating that with family too, right? To talk mm-hmm. about, you know, what, what, you know, what we have. And also, because the thing is, for a lot of people, it's not just what we have, because the reality is in these, pain, you know, in these challenging times, for a lot of people, they don't have very much, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people, you know, their jobs are threatened, and there's, there's so much going on. But... Um, and it's easy. I think we become complacent, right? We become complacent. Um, I've been talking to so many friends in Syria and Jordan and, and, you know, in, in, you know, many countries. And in many ways, you know, we, people think, you know, we like to think, well, we're, we're the developed world or whatever. But, you know, a sort of a, you know, a human intelligence, right? Of being able to put things in perspective. Sometimes, you know, we, we become materially stunted, right? Um, that you know, a lot of people. I've, I've a number of friends in South Africa. One who lives just on the edge of a shanty town, right? That's how are things? He's like so happy. He's talking about everything that's going on. I says, "How's work?" So oh, I, I haven't had work for two months. How do you support myself? So the, between my my parents and my neighbors, and we were talking like for forty five minutes, and he had no complaint, right? Then I'm like, I know a number of more established people in South Africa, so how are things? Things are devastating, but it's all good, right? Because there's a wider perspective, right? Um, and sometimes this helps, and it helps with children too, to, you know, to mm-hmm. embrace that perspective. That's right. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it serves as a reminder, um, you know, the, like the fact that we're presented with um, a challenge that's new to us. So it, it, it's, it's having us perhaps... It's an opportunity for us to develop a side of ourselves or to, um, you know, flex a muscle or work a muscle that we haven't had the ability to work in the past because we've never been presented with these sort of unprecedented, um, you know, circumstances. So we, we almost year after year in Ramadan, you take it for granted, for instance, that you're able to go to the mosque or that you're able to go. And, and, and go to an iftar party at your parents' house and your relatives' house, and it's a house full of people. Um, and so those things are suddenly taken away from us, or or, the, or those opportunities are going to be far more limited. Um, so if, we're, if, if we leave aside being politically correct, uh, right. uh, uh, brother Pervis, you know, so many Ramadans, like you know, we we all we almost complain about our social life. That's right. right? That's right. Yeah. It's like. You're right. Another iftar, and oh That's my right. god! And I've had multiple situations where, like, I'm invited to a friend's house, and I, you know, uh, see for us, you really have to come. Mm-hmm. But I've, I already have to go somewhere else too, right? So you kind of like, it's a very delicate dance, right? 
That's right. Like last year, the one of the masajid invited me, but my then my mother pulled the mother card. Says Berta, yeah, I'm making the hari. Like, no, I, just, I, I, I did both, but we sort of right. take it as it's right. such a blessing. I haven't seen my parents live down the road, right? I haven't, but they're you know they got very delicate health. I haven't seen them for six weeks, right? Yeah. Right. But so we, but we appreciate things, right? And and it's just good to em- embrace that, right? That's um, a really good point. Really, just embrace things. One of the things related to sort of embracing it is a lot of people are fretting about I won't be able to do this and this and this. That from a, a spiritual perspective, right? Um, you know, Ibn Atayla says that you know when Allah sends us these kinds of situations, He says, "Don't fret if your spiritual works diminish. That I can't, I won't be able to do khatm of Quran. I won't be able to do this. I won't be able to do this." I won't, you know, uh, because said these these kinds of exp- you know these uh, you know these overwhelming experiences Allah are are from Allah to you, and how can you compare what's from Allah to you to what's from you to Allah, right? Okay? In that you know we focus. I will fast. I will do this of the Quran. I'll do this. I'll do this. You know. A number of people say, I've lost my job. I can't give in charity this year. I used to give every single day of Ramadan. But that's all that you are presenting to Allah. Right now, you have an immersive experience of divine majesty. Right? So, accept that. Right? Accept that and, and rejoice. Right? It rejoice. Appreciate what you do have and, and rejoice. And and don't stress out the things you're not able to do. You're not able to do. Mm. Right? And Allah not knows what's in our hearts and He knows our efforts, right? And um and to instill that in our in our children too, right? That um if I could uh, like interject with the maybe perhaps a little bit more of a technical question, but at the same time, you know, um in that spirit of uh, making do with you know the realities and and the circumstances that we have and to make the most of it is the um, is is the issue of tarawih prayers right we we have mentioned that um, so normally obviously as, as I mentioned you know everyone knows you know we perform them communally at the mosque and so this year that probably won't happen and so you know how do you just from a technical and then we can get into you know maybe more of a philosophical conversation around it um but but from a technical issue um you know can you perform those prayers at the house and 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 what are the sort of um you know mechanics of how you do that right because typically you finish the quran you know and so on um i i know for for example people who may perhaps have limited uh portions of the quran memorized well, how can I do tarawih when I don't have portions of the Quran memorized? Can I hold the mushaf even? You know, there's those type of technical issues. So if you could just answer maybe some of those technical aspects um, yeah. as well. So um, one is tarawih itself, you know, is a sunnah. And the, you know, so in, in, in the four schools, performing 20 rakahs is sunnah. But the nature of sunnahs is one does as much as we can, right? The Prophet said it. Whatever I have encouraged you to do, whatever I have forbidden you, leave completely. Whatever I have encouraged you to do, do of it as much as you are able, right? And that's our Prophet's life, right? So the, the, the optimal sunnah is to do 20 rakahs. That sunnah is fulfilled whether you pray at the masjid or at, or at home, in congregation or alone. It fulfills the sunnah, right? Now there's many merits of performing it at the mosque, but there's also merits in, in performing it at home, right? Um, so at, at that level, you know, it, tarawih remains sunnah and one does it at home for, for both men and for women. Um, ideally, if you can do 20, do 20, or otherwise do what you can, right? Do, uh, do, do, do what you can. Um, completing the Quran in tarawih is just a general recommendation. It's not an emphasized sunnah. Um, if you can't do it, there's a number of options, right? Um, in the Hanafi school itself, and that's sort of what, you know, personally uh, I follow, they don't consider it from the sunnah. They consider it contrary to the sunnah to, to hold a copy of the Quran 
because it's considered a completely foreign action to the prayer. So one doesn't, but there is leeway. You know, that's part of the mercy of our religion, that there are multiple schools, and there is leeway. If someone really wants to, you know, or wants to, there are, there are other opinions there that would permit, you know, um, you know, reciting from, from a copy of the Qur'an. And, you know, so if someone wants to, it's there, right? Um, and there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever, because that's part of the diversity of our religion, right? Someone wants you know, are being Hanafi or this or that, these are not identities, right? These are, a, this is a consistent way of understanding the Sunnah that I try to follow. But if someone, and especially if you're taking another opinion, not to, you know, even if you want to give yourself an easier way out, it's allowed. Right? Unless you make it your inevitable habit always just to cut corners, um, you know, uh, a dispensation is like a shortcut, sometimes shortcuts are good, right? Especially if they make things easy. But, here, if you want to do, take a dispensation to bring more worship into your life, there is an option there. Okay? Um, another option, and, but some people prefer to stick to something that they're familiar with and they're accustomed to. Then another option is that there is tremendous merit in listening to the Qur'an. It's actually a neglected sunnah. The Prophet asked a whole number of companions to recite the Qur'an to him. And a number of them were surprised. Ubayy ibn Ka'b asked him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, why would I recite it to you when it was revealed to you? And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I love to hear it from other than me. Okay? So this is one of the things we can do that, you know, we're not dealing with the great accountant, right? And within the family, there's so many ways. You know, the doors of turning to Allah are as numerous as the breaths of creation. You know? Let's get together as a family and read whatever we can, right? So get everybody read a little bit, and some families that that would work beautifully, right? That let's just read a little bit and to keep it light. That okay, we're not you know since we're not going to the masjid after Isha, it can be done even before Taraweeh, whatever. Let's just recite some Quran together, whatever. And each family has its dynamic and circumstance. It's not about quantity, right? It's about that coming together. Um, if you're alone, you can do that with a couple of friends. Let's just read a little bit of Qur'an, um, an amount that you know, everybody is keen to do. And that's, you know, that's you know, the door of that. And it's fulfilling a big sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One can do also just, to do khatm of the Qur'an, just listen to it, right? Just, um, you can, you know, outside of Taraweeh, you can also listen to it. And there's merit in that. Right? Um, you could take the opportunity, you can't make it to Taraweeh, read the Qur'an. Imam Zaid and others suggest that, you know, for a lot of people, yes, we recite the, you know, the Arabic Qur'an devotionally, but it's okay. This year I'm not able to make it to Taraweeh, why don't I read the, the, the translation? Right? right? Or as much as I can. Right? Um, and so, you know, the 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 doors of good are, are so many. It's like we're spoiled for choice, right? I could do this or this or this or this, right? And, you know, and the governing thing there is, you know, the Prophet said, take from, take from actions whatever you can sustain. Because Allah does not tire. It is you who tire, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And our religion is easy, but the Prophet also said, truly this religion is deep. So enter its depths gently. Right, right. Right. Those are, those are some really gently good... meaning to yourself, right? Gently to yourself. Don't be hard on yourself, right? Yeah. Like Allah is not out there to trip us up. That okay, what did you do this Ramadan? No. He's saying, you know, that I am near, right? So and and, and you know, one of the if you look historically, whenever times were tough, the great saints of Islam, the great um and some people get tied up in knots about the word saint, but you know, the great awliya that's right. Um, you know, emphasized rejoicing, right? Rejoicing, mm. right? That is really important. Just set, step back, right? There's few acts of worship you can do as much as sit back and breathe with contentment, right? Right? Allah SWT says in the Quran, say, in the bounty of Allah and in His mercy, in that let them rejoice. Mm -hmm. It is far better than all that they amass. 
And we don't just amass wealth and status and our worldly goals. We amass our religious sense That's of right. status too. Right. right. It's not just that. It's not that be a slacker. Right. right. Do do what you can, but you're dealing with the most generous, right? Right. So so be, we should be very content. We should be happy. Allah says, "Falyafra, let them rejoice." Yafra. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah? And so, you know, I, once I was walking in in, in Jordan with one of the learned scholars and suddenly he stopped and looked at me and said, you know, one of the most important principles of our religion is rejoicing in Allah. And he continued walking. I'm wondering, like, where did that come from? God, it's totally unexpected. But but really, I think if, if there's one thing to do this Ramadan is learn to rejoice in your Lord. Right? Right? That, you know, just yeah. you know, and that, and to inculcate that in our children, because not conditional, right? Whatever happens, you know, you have the gift of life, you you have the gift of existence, you have the gift of life, you know, you have the gift of being a human being, you have the gift of faith and guidance, right? If you have all these and you had nothing else, you know, like you're in all possible good. And then, but we're surrounded by so much other good, and we learn how to appreciate it, right? And then the little things the Prophet comes taught, taught us, look at them with amazement, right? To appreciate them, right? Like we appreciate now, you know, bread because it's it's challenging because with you know three teenagers and two two parents, you know, everybody has their food preferences, right? So when you have the little things, oh, we we got the bread this time. Instead of complaining that, oh my God, I didn't get the jam, right? Just yeah. what an amazing gift, right? That we have yeah. these things. You don't have to make it yourself, right? Um, That's right. So, so uh, you know, you know, so I, I, you know, we should be convinced, and and the idea of trusting in Allah's generosity that we should have complete community that, you know, that this Ramadan will be better than any other Ramadan, regardless of our circumstance, right? Because it's not about how much I do, right? It's about waking up to Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, right? The encompassingly merciful and the deeply merciful, right? Yeah. And, and, and that, that, that you encouraging us to look through things through the perspective of a, of a believer, and, and I, I really appreciate that. And also the the practical tips and and, and uh, pointing us in the right direction with regard to uh, practical steps we can take with worship. I had a question for you. I'm hearing about these virtual virtual iftars, right? And and a big part of Ramadan is the connecting with your family and your friends, maybe people you you've uh, broken from or just haven't seen and uh, given enough uh, attention to. Even your own parents maybe double down on how often you talk to them. And I've seen some ideas like virtual iftars. Um, we've seen an increase in things like Zoom. What are your what are your what are your recommendations on how to keep those community and family ties strong during during this time these are these are opportunities right that it's you know um you know and there's all the downsides of technology right but when allah whatever allah tests us he also you know every challenge comes with opportunities right that one of the things i, I have a cousin in australia he, you know we set up a, a cousin's group on WhatsApp, right? So we have several family groups. We said, okay, let's the cousins just get together, right? Um, and we agreed because amongst the cousins, there's some atheist cousins and there's a mullah cousin, but we, we all get along as cousins. So we, we had we had positive guidelines, and we each knew who was meant by what: the environmentalist <laughs> cousin and the vegetarian cousin, and you know, we're all over the place. But right. it, you know. To the extent that one can, this is this is a good opportunity. That sometimes when we step back, there's opportunity. There's old friends you can connect with, family members that you can reach out to, you know. Um, and a lot of generous. If you say, okay, guys, let's let's have a virtual iftar or even other things. You know, I don't know how food delivery services are where you are, but like you know, by you know, if if you're able to surprise someone by sending some food over to them. Right, um, or you know, sharing food with others. Right, um, 
But whatever is facilitated, sometimes just that, that phone call, right? Uh, I called one of my teachers in Damascus, and you know, he's like a generation older than me, and he was really thankful. And he admitted, you know, I was feeling kind of alone, right? Because everybody's like, the sheikh is busy, whatever. But now for the first time in his life, he's home all this time, and it's just him and his wife, and, and you know, a bunch of kids. And he said, thank you for I was, I was surprised, because usually he would be so busy that you have to kind of squeeze in right. every time. Right. So, so I think, you know, but without overwhelming oneself, Man, there, there's good opportunities. And in these things, never, you know, you know we, we don't nickel and dime the divine, right? That, okay, it's not a real iftar. No, right? Like, you know, you invite some people. It doesn't necessarily have to be iftar time. Many of us have family all over the place. So if it's iftar for, like if it's iftar for me, it's not iftar for you. But we, you know, we, you know we, we do what we can. It's also a good opportunity to connect with the people we know we should connect with, but we don't. Right, those those friends, this and that, um, and also if we find ourselves in circumstances where things are good in our life, it's a real reality. A lot of people, for example, with mental health issues, right, with depression issues, who are alone, you know, situation like this aggravate their condition as well, right. So it's important, you know, if one has people who are kind of alone or they have been struggling you know, to, to, to reach out you know because we may not be able to give in, you know many people may not be able to give us as much in charity this you know this year as they wanted to but we can give of our of our time our attention our care um, and also the, the other thing is that you know for, for a lot of people um, you know I, well, one thing I've seen just, you know, by, you know, we, have, we run an answer service and a lot of people, one, th one of the things that hurt people deeply in their lives is we try to be strong, right? I can do it. It's part of this individualism that is inculcated with us. And especially when things are difficult and stuff, and now it is, and despite all the gratitude, it, it's, it, it, you know, we don't deny reality for a lot of people. If you, if you find it difficult, it's difficult, right? And, don't be, don't try to be strong, right? Part of mercy, they say, you know, mercy begins with being merciful to yourself, right? right. If you, you feel alone, you're finding it difficult, reach out, right? Okay. Reach out. Um, and, you know, and, and that's very important because a lot of people, you know, go, you know, they're dealing, so if you're in a situation where you find ease and stuff, reach out to others, right? But also if you find, difficulty and there's so many uncertainties and so on just reach out right just reach out and don't think that people won't be there people are busy etc no right um because uh one of the, one of the important things our, our our religion is not one of isolation right right in you know in religious terms isolation is spiritually praiseworthy under certain conditions, right? Mm. In a limited amount. But the Prophet doesn't make very clear that the general thrust of our religion is that we are, we are social, we are human beings, are social beings, mm -hmm. and our religion is a social religion, right? Isolation is a spiritual choice at certain times, but socially, isolation is a bid'ah. Mm. So much so, it, it, Dr. Omar got me in trouble one year because he was at a conference and he said, they got him a really nice suite. He said, you, ha you guys have to stay with me. I said, Dr. Omar, you know, there's some, you know, there's some politics and tensions. We can't do that, right? We got our own room. He said, cancel it. So there's a few of us. We're all kind of in trouble with the organizers because things happen. Dr. Omar said, no, please stay with me. And then he's our senior. We, we stayed. And then he explained why. Because he said, because said in the Maliki school, it's actually disliked to sleep alone in, in a room. Right? And I started looking into it. This is almost a decade ago. And the Prophet said, some discourage living alone. Right? Discourage eating alone. Discourage going out at night alone. 
discourage traveling alone, even for men, right? That if someone could travel with others, they shouldn't. And it's not just because of harm and so on, like physical harm, but because any of these things, like, you know, the human just by nature, and you know, the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever eats alone, when they could, when, and it's under, when they could eat with others, the shaitan is their eating companion, right? So that component's very important, that yeah, there's a merit to, to taking some time for spiritual isolation, for contemplation, etc. But, you know, within the family, right? Um, but also in one's circles of friends and family, you know, connect with people, even at home. A lot of people, and we had this challenge, you know, now for the longest time, you know, we, we've homeschooled, the kids were all off devices, but now they're all teens and they all have their machines. So it's very easy for everybody to be disconnected. We're all home together, but we're all alone together, right? That, and it, and it can be really tough for, you know, a lot of kids, like you sit down and listen to them, they're disturbed. What's going on? Are things going to go back the way they were? They hear these things. My, my daughter, who's just a year older than yours over, yeah, she got turned on notifications on her Chromebook for news. For, for what's the, you know, the COVID-19, like, Infection count. Infection Yeah. Right. Says, it's stressing me out. So what do you do? So I turned it off. I said, why? So I could begin to feel my stress level, Abuji. So I said, good stuff. But you know, but very often they won't talk to us, right? So I think creating those, those bonds, right? And you know, so especially in these times that that is a greater ibadah, right? right? That connecting with one another I said, okay, Ramadan, I'm going to go into my corner and I'm going to knock off 100 rakahs a night. Do that part, but I think that the human connection is really, really important, right? That's One it. within our families itself, but also if someone feels alone, right? And also with, with, with children, especially in the, even I'm, I'm seeing with my own three year old, she's just up, yeah, she's two and a half. She's kind of confused. Like, What's going on? Right? Nobody we're not that. able to go out, right. et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So, but it's really important to just, you know, express ourselves, right? And that's where the Prophet Sallallahu example, right? That he, he listened deeply, right? He listened deeply. Let, let people talk, right? Let people talk. And the Sahaba would be surprised in gathering the prophets, with the Prophet Sallallahu the Sahaba would talk a lot more than the Prophet Sallallahu did. And I think, especially those of us who are parents, etc., it's really, really important. Let, let our children express it. Don't just go into, okay, we have, there's a dozen live streams that I'd like you to watch. And there's this and this and this. Because alhamdulillah, there's so much available. But along with that religious thing, it, it is a religious act to connect socially, right? Yeah. Um, so so that's, that's one of the things that I've been finding is, is very important. Yeah, those are those are super practical. Yeah, tips. and you know something you said, uh, Chef Faraz, uh, like that really fascinated me, and I think it's a real profound point, which is this idea of 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 sohba or or being you know being social as opposed to isolation, being sort of the um, preferred or, or laudable you know sort of circumstance or, or, or position as opposed to. You know what I mean? Like, and so, because I, I, yeah, because oftentimes we approach religion as being something that is so, you know, that is so uh, individual or personal. Um, and so I find that a very fascinating point. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, you know, that sort of tension or the balance between, it, you know, sohba and uzda, like I, isolation as it were. But but in that as well, you know, often when when you know people get religious, right? Um, there's this thing that okay, they don't keep bad company, don't do this, mm -hmm. right? disconnect. So one of the things that I was blown away by, right? Uh, one is called that good company is of two types, right? Religiously, with one, you know, good company, the company of the learned, the righteous, you know, the religious, etc. That you know, good company. Another type of good company, right, that is also you know, religiously beneficial, draws you closer to Allah, is any company kept with a good intention, in a good way, towards good outcomes. Right? That's good company. Right? So, 
the fact, you know, like while maintaining social distancing, if you reach out to your neighbor and, you know, and you realize your neighbor's alone, right? Whatever. And you just keep in touch with them. They're not, they may not be a believer. They may, they may be whatever they are, right? But that's good company because it's kept to the good intention in a good way towards good outcomes, right? Um, and that's really important, you know, with broader family, you know, just in our, and I feel guilty saying a lot of this because <laughs> there's so many big things happening and, you know, especially you know, having a special, you know, being specialized in Islamic law, there's so many, you know, death issues and this and that, all these legal issues that are arising right now that we have to address. But, but then, you know, so many uncles and many people wondering, like many of our elders thinking about death or actually we had to get Imam Khalid Latif involved in our something related to the family here because one of our elders his his daughter told him that dad if you don't observe social isolation you're going to die so write your will he says I am writing my Islamic will and he, but then he was depressed yeah <laughs> so um, that's, that's, a, a, that's a, a okay. really good point and you know, um, yeah you know you're absolutely right like I, I it was funny because I, having you on the show, like I, I, I was, I, I, I didn't want to get into the sort of technical, like avoid technicalities as much as possible because, you know, I, and, and so you kind of took the conversation very naturally into just talking about a real practical kind of things. And so I appreciate that because like you said, I mean, you are a trained legal scholar and yet we avoided a lot of those sort of legal, you know, legal conversations. And so I think, um, I, for one, really appreciate that. Um, no, and I definitely want to echo that. We literally talked beforehand, like that's we, right. just about what we what want to be right. the the crux of the show, and and yeah. everything you talked about was exactly what we wanted. Exactly, right, right. Practical right. tips Beautiful. that right. people can apply. Um, you know, starting on Inshallah Friday or whenever Ramadan starts, um, and uh, and not get too much into the weeds of the fiqh and and. Um, and so on. So you really appreciate. Oh, but but also but also with that, like you know, and I say this like I, I you know, you know, like I've done like f almost five hours of fit classes before this today, right? Um, <laughs> so and, this was a palate cleanser and, then for you, right? No, 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 no. But <laughs> no, but it's it's important. But at the same time, you know, we have to, you know, keep in mind that as one of my teachers, says, Allah will not send take send someone to hell on a technicality, right? Like Allah is not out to get us, right? Mm -hmm. That you know, and sometimes being too technical in our approach to religion can be bad manners, right? It's like Imam Ghazali says, when you recite Quran in the prayer, don't overdo the proper recitation, right? He says because if you go to the king and say your, let me say that again, yeah. your your honor, right? No, it's, it's bad manners, right? Is that there is a respect, but there's also a, you have to be relaxed about it, right? And that's, that's really important that, especially when things are difficult and you're dealing the most generous, you know, don't, we should not overwhelm ourselves, right? It, it, not, like, oh. Sorry, real quick, that, that, cause that, that's a fascinating point. So is it because it, it wouldn't be authentic? It, it, you know, would it be almost like you're sort of faking it? Is that what sort of Imam well, but, but is But also it's about? like, you know, but it's, no, but it's also, mm -hmm. it's almost like having a bad opinion of Allah, right? Oh, right. That, right, right. right? Like that, that he okay. demands this. Yeah. No, the, the Prophet said, strive for, strive for uprightness, but you won't be able to be completely upright. It's one of my favorite hadiths, right? Prophet said, istaqimu, seek istiqama, seek uprightness, but he said, you won't be able to be completely upright. So what do you do? He, and he summarized it in three words. He says, wa qaribu abshiru. Do the best, remain committed. Do the best you can. Wa abshiru, and be of glad tidings. Literally rejoice, right? Going you're back to the to point you made, rejoice. Yeah, yeah. You're, try, you're trying to do the right thing, right? So that's really important, right? Because a lot of people say, okay, we need to make this checklist. We need to do this. And our parents, you know, as parents, even with kids, to be honest, like, you know, like if kids are feeling stressed and Ramadan's coming and the, you know, the online schooling, you know, and I thought, you know, my, um, one of our family members, we, we discussed about their kids and I just sort of meant to coach the parents to the solution said, if your kids are feeling stressed, cut down on hours. You don't have to do all the schooling right now, right? Just relax, right? 
And sometimes it's good, right? There's a time, of course, if you're relaxing while you're here, that's detrimental, but sometimes, you know, if you see signs of stress on your child, sometimes even the school will, will a lot of them are giving thoughtful guidelines, right? So, so you just, we should just embrace that, embrace that mercy, do the best we can, right? But, you know, Ibn Atayullah says the most generous, Al Karim, la tatakhattahu al amal. The most generous, the highest of hopes cannot outstrip his generosity, right? So, um, you know, so, you know, we should have complete conviction, you know, that Allah will grant us it. You know, we have to shift the grammar of our religious language, right? It's not that I am going to have a great Ramadan, but that Allah will grant us the best of Ramadan, right? I love that. Um, yeah. So I, and I, I'm going to contradict what I said earlier by asking you one last technical question because this is bound to come up. Um, so in, in, in the likelihood that, that Ramadan is going to be in isolation, and we've talked a lot about that, uh, Eid, right? The festival at the end of Ramadan. So what if Eid is also under quarantine? So could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Because, I mean, I know that there is a, certainly there's a communal aspect to it. And in fact, uh, some of the things that we do on Eid are very much predicated on that communal aspect. So please talk about that, if you could, from a technical point of view, and then... Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so broadly, the, you know, the scholars state that the conditions for, for Eid are the conditions of, of, of Juma, right? So anybody for whom Friday prayer is not obligatory, Juma, uh, Eid prayer is not obligatory, right? And whenever the conditions for valid Juma are not fulfilled, Eid prayer would not be valid, right? If the three of us are, were on a journey, or if the three of us were camping, we wouldn't do Eid prayer. Because we're not, you know, the, you know the, if the base conditions of, of Friday prayer of, are not found, then uh, Eid prayer would not be done either. And this is not actually an unusual state of affairs, right? There's, you know, for people who live in the countryside, in the village, in the desert, there is no, they don't do Friday prayer, they don't do Juma, uh, they don't do Eid, because, you know, like across the, the, the schools of Islamic law, it, it, it didn't, generally wouldn't be required, but they don't feel they miss out. They still celebrate Eid, there's just one, one aspect mm. like, that they don't have. Yeah, like, that's right. I Good found point. a, a Mauritanian, a classic, like a classical Mauritanian text um, in Maliki Fiqh, someone gifted it to me. So I took it to Sheikh Salik. In, I was visiting the Bay Area in 2014 or 2015. I asked him, like, this is a really strange book. There's no chapter on Friday prayer. There's no chapter on Eid. Like, what's going on? He said, because it's written for my people. And he was laughing. I said, what do you mean by your people? I said, we live in the, in the desert. Is there Juma in the desert? I said, no. He said, there Eid prayer? I said, no. So, you know, if, you know, inshallah, if, if Allah facilitates it, we, we celebrate Eid, etc. But the sunnah of, you know, of eating and rejoicing, the, 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 those sunnahs apply. All the sunnahs of it, we're not able to do Eid. The other thing is, we know for sure that the, a person will be rewarded in accordance with their intentions. So we have the intention that I would have gone to the masjid, I would have done taraweeh, I would have tried to do this. We're rewarded for those intentions. And the reward means that it's not just that we'll have, like, it'll be checked off. We have the next worldly benefit of it, but also the, 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 wor the worldly benefits of it. And then, you know, you know, practically, the doors that do open, we partake of them, right? We partake of them. You know, if you can, you know, communities, and I think many communities are being quite dynamic about it, that, okay, why don't we, you know, get everybody on, on a Zoom, let's all dress up, let's do this, whatever, you know, what, whatever things we are able to do, um, we do them. You know, one of the things we realized, we've actually, we as a family, put a little pause on Eid days, because we realized, because we go, you know, alhamdulillah, we have a lot of our, our family here, that we not get like 10 minutes just as a family together for Eid. So we do like, after Eid prayer, come home, spend a, you know, a few moments together, and then we go, my parents, my wife's parents, and then the whole circus. So, you know, so what is facilitated, we take it, but this idea, there, 
there is no notion of missing out as a believer, right? You know, as the Prophet Sallallahu has said. So we have the full reward of Friday prayer, of Taraweeh, of Eid prayer, etc. And then what? The doors that Allah opens, you know, we, we, you know, we take them, right? And I think there, uh, there are many. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask two more, sorry, two more questions. And I know I was going to hand it off to Omar, but um, two more very, very quick questions. Um, one is, um, would you, is there anything in the books of, sort of, is there anything in classical jurisprudence dealing with the issue of fasting during kind of a, a, a epidemic or pandemic that we're seeing, right? Because you're, you're, you you have issues such as people who might be immunocompromised and where fasting would further exacerbate uh, that condition, right? Um, or is would it be the same advice as anyone who is uh, prone to health issues consulting a physician? That's one question. And then second question, and I, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but, um, you know, you're from Pakistan, I'm from the subcontinent. Um, Pakistan has sort of been almost, I would maybe arguably unique in the sense that the ulama in, in, in Pakistan have argued for the opening of the masajid, um, you know, with, with various other caveats around social distancing and so on and masks and so on. But it was almost sort of very, they were very adamant about opening the mosques, um, you know, quickly. And uh, among many notable luminary scholars who are part of that uh, fatwa, um, so if you feel uh, comfortable commenting on that, I I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, and then I promise uh, I'm going to hand, hand it off to Omar. So the, the, with respect to you know, the, the, the first question regarding, um, just you can nudge me, sorry. Um, the, sorry, what was the first question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I <laughs> know we got it. So the first question was about um, in the classical books around yeah. uh, fasting or Ramadan in the age of pandemic. Yeah. So um, a lot was written about the, about the, the diff you know, the, the different plagues and, you know, and, and pandemics that took place. Um, and some of it very touching. Because like one of the scholars who wrote about Ibn Hajar lost three, buried three or maybe four of his own daughters during that time, right? And many, many, many of the scholars wrote, um, and you know, and it's and there's some really good things out there. Um, you know, uh, Sheikh Yasir Qadi has a really nice thing, and it's it's an easy Google about you know, sort of the history of the pandemic through Islamic history, right? And very very thoughtful, you know. And I was listening to one of the Arab scholars. They say. In Cairo, just in the 19th century, is they say it's documented in the the records at Al Azhar that the scholars were asked about inheritance shifted between seven people in one day because of deaths. Right? Yeah. yeah, how many times? It, it, you know, wow. like you know, husband died, your know, wife inherited, but then it went from to you know. It went seven times in one day because there's, there's so many deaths, right? So that several people, people, you know, there's, there's entire neighborhoods where they said it's just too dangerous to go even collect the dead. So the ulama said just wait till everything dies down. So there's people who are dead on the streets who are not collected for, in the streets in a Muslim city for, for, for weeks on end, right? So human, humanity is dealt with, you know, a lot, a lot. Um, you know, um, you know, and so they've, they've discussed in general, you know, the, the basis is that, you know, a, a person would fast unless there's genuine fear of undue hardship or harm, right? So someone's just like, well, you know, I'm physically, I'm physically a bit weak, but if you're normally able to fast and then one should do so. But if you're in a situation where there's reasonable fear of harm, either because of what you know of your own uh, medical condition or um, of what, of, of, because of medical advice. And of course, and sometimes, you know, medical advice is not clear cut. I have, I have two doctors, you know, I have two Muslim doctors. Uh, one of them, yeah, I asked him last year, should I fast? He said, are you asking me as a professional or ask, are you asking me as a Muslim? I said, as a Muslim. He goes, you better, I said, as a professional. He said, it would appear that your condition is such that 
you should at least give it a good attempt. I said, that's pretty much the same answer. So I asked my family doctor. Um, and he said, please don't do it. Right? And it's not an awkward situation. There's this world-class <laughs> specialist saying, you better do it. And my family doctor, I, frankly, I trust more, right, said, don't. So, you know, one, ultimately, one follow, you know, one just looks where, what, what are one's circumstances. And in that, you know, um, there's a fundamental difference between, you know, being a slacker, just saying, yeah, whatever, I don't, I don't need to do it. And that's where, ultimately, you know, we have to be honest with, with ourselves and, you know, be honest in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a situation where there is genuine, reasonable fear, right? And in that, um, don't try to be too tough. Consult. Yeah? Reach out to your doctors. In Canada, you know, you know, like other civilized countries, we do have in national health care, etc. But um, I like um, that little jab. <laughs> like other um, civilized countries, <laughs> we have natural nationalized um, health care. Yeah. Of course, anyway, sorry, logically, for if you say A is B, it doesn't mean that C is not B, right? Say that again. Sorry, oh, yeah. I, I was talking over. If you say a, a A is B, does not mean that C is not B, okay? Okay, right, right. <laughs> so, if Canada is is from the civilized countries because it has healthcare, does not necessarily mean that other countries that don't have healthcare are not civilized countries. But it takes right? me back to like an LSAT. That's like an LSAT question, yeah. you know, like the exam yeah. for law school. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I've been teaching. T t I'm actually actively teaching logic these days. So. Oh, great, great! Yeah, those are all logical logic exercises. Yeah. Um, uh, but, sorry, you were going to make a point. In, in that, yeah. yeah. No, so there, like in these kinds of situations, right? Mm -hmm. um, if if there's reason to, to to fear, like so in Canada, like they're saying, like if you want to give in charity and you don't have money, just make an appointment with your family doctor, right? <laughs> because they can bill for it, right? Um, so, of course, not unnecessarily, cause, but, you know, many doctors are, are struggling. Too, struggling. Right? That's They're, a great point. That's right. right? <laughs> Charity has taken on a whole new so, meaning in these days, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Good point. Um, yeah. I was wondering, actually, one of the doctors contact. you know, they were very keen to have an appointment with someone in our household. And I was wondering, like, why? And I was listening to the It was like a three-minute call. And there was nothing, so, but they could, they can bill for half an hour, right? Um, but, you know, so, you know, if there's, there's any reason to fear, like someone ha is, you know, immunocompromised, or they could be, you know, reasonable fear, then just, the Prophet says, some said, seek an answer from your heart, right? Mm, that, see objectively that is, would this be a reasonable excuse? If you're not clear, just consult. You just consult, reach out, ask, and, and you know, be honest with yourself. If it's just that I, I just want to weigh out and don't want to do it, then it's probably better to do it. Right. But if it's you know, there's there's genuine fear, then you don't have like I've been spending a lot of time convincing a lot of the elders in our family, please don't fast. Mm. I've talked to doctors and for, for many people who are in sensitive situations, etc. A, no, a number of them are in situations where they do need to go out, right? Yeah. Right. I, because you know, their own children, because they have little kids, etc. They're not able, you know, they, they drop off groceries on a weekly basis, whatever, but they do need to go out, at least for some of the basics, um, to pick up the medication, whatever. So they need to be careful. And if, you know, just ask your doctor that, you know, if, would this, would, could this be reasonable fear of harm if it is? And you know, a lot of doctors were sensitive. Are aware of Muslims and, and fasting and how important it is, um, and you know, and you know, you don't have to be too tough about it, right? That you you'll be rewarded for the intent. If you have the intent that I want, I want to fast, but can I? If you wanted to fast, but it realized that no, I can't without fear of harm. You have the full reward of your intention. And there's so many. Uh, hadiths about the, about the Prophet Sallallahu that the one who's sick or traveling has the full reward of of what they used to do when they when they were well and resident, right? Um, so you know, and for many people, it's it's very normal to fast, right, during this circumstance. For mm -hmm. other people, it it may not be it may not be safe, right? Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah. No, thank so, you for that. Um, um, 
And if you want to take a step. And also, but be sensitive. But I, I would also say be sensitive because mm -hmm. uh, many of our elders, you know, one, they feel like they feel more deeply that they're missing out than many younger people. That's right. right? Almost more zealous, um, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because they can't imagine. That's right. Right. Not fasting, not doing this. Right. And, and so it's good. That's where it's good just to listen, you know, um, and, you know, actually one of my mentors, um, a few years ago, he had cancer. And he's not a scholar, but from a religious family. I had to tell him that please listen to the doctors. Please do not fast. Because he was delaying his medication. As long as I, said, I didn't grow up to be a slacker. I fast. Yeah. So I had to convince him, look, I had to pull, I started to pull Sheikh on him. Even though he's my mentor, I said, listen. We're in my specialty right now. I defer to you on this, this, and this. But here, listen. To, please listen to me, because yeah. yeah, just normal reasoning didn't work. I had to sort of get legal on him. I said, "Look, <laughs> it may well be sinful for you to fast right now. Because if you take, if you do something to harm your own health, especially when you have other people who are dependent upon you, etc., that's not being brave, uh, etc." Right. Um, you've the second question. You really hit a sensitive spot. Um, and, you know, that's when I say, you know, I often introduce myself as being Indian Canadian rather than Pakistani <laughs> Canadian. Um, because, you know, identity is a very confused and confusing thing. Yeah. Um, but um, Pakistan is very complicated, right? Yeah. When I was in, I, I spent some time in 2007 in Pakistan. Uh, it was awesome. It was also the most traumatic time in my life because just... You know, and um, you know, Pakistan is sort of like a, the proof for the existence of God, right? Like, how could a place be so chaotic, yet, yet people survive? Like, you know, you they should see put many signs like, of, of right. They should put that on the like, like the travel. You know, <laughs> it should be the byline for the travel, like travel no, to Pakistan. And it's really the proof yeah. of the existence of God. <laughs> well, it's it's an amazing place. It's an amazing yeah, no. place. Agreed. And there's such amazing people and so on. But at the same time. There is, you know, there is, you know, we are still in a sort of, you know, suffering through the post-colonial stress disorder, right? Uh, in our, at many levels, you know, socially, culturally, politically, but also religiously, right? And, um, and, and the ulama, there is, I don't envy any of them because they're in a very, complicated situation there's so much anger and so many like you know a lot of the religious groups it's almost like and this is totally politically incorrect but it's almost like they're like gangs right that if you're in any gang you know the gang leader has to show that i'm the toughest <laughs> gangster in town right <laughs> because if you're not you know you know you're under threat right so, you know, I've visited many of these scholars, um, and each of them has death threats against them. Right. Right? And they live under 24-hour security, even in their own madrasas. But the sh sad thing is, the death threats they get are not from other groups, but from people from within their own groups. Wow. That these are sellouts and cop-outs yeah. and this and that. So yeah. it's, a, it's a really complex situation. Um, so we're not really judging the individuals and their circumstance, but but is it problematic? Yes, is it problematic at two levels? One, in that in matters returning to expertise, you know, Islamic law tells us that we defer to to those people of expertise, mm. determining that fiqh lays out that this is grave harm, this is slight harm, etc. Right. But is the, does this medical condition? Or does this pandemic constitute grave harm that is likely to be widespread? That's not for the scholar to determine. That's for the medical expert to determine. And then the scholar, you know, co collaborates with them to see, okay, how do these implications play out? So that's one aspect. The other aspect that even when there is difference of opinion, right? And we're not a quietist religion, and there's a role for, you know, for standing up to the oppressor, etc. But the basis is. That in matters where there's difference in judgment, there's difference in, in, in law, if the government says this is the course of action we're going to take, then they say that the 
judgment of the ruler lifts difference of opinion. Wow. Right? And that's an important principle. And that applies to the ruler. It also applies, just as a practical point, in an organizational sense. Right? That if, if there's six of us who are part of the board, um, if we decide, you know, or let's say in the, in the masjid, they decide that this is how we are going to be, this, these are the times of the prayer. Theoretically, we could set the prayer times by a dozen criteria. But if those in authority decide this, then there's, there's, a, a, there's a way to protest it, disagree, but we cannot rebel against that, right? If it's within the parameters of accepted difference, right? If people say, okay, for convenience, we're going to pray Dhuhr before it's time. That's not up for different disagreement, right? That's just outside the scope of accepted scholarship. But here, when the you, the, the government is very clear that this is you know, this is what is in the preservation of public health and saving of lives, it would appear to be very different, difficult to reconcile any religious stance that flouts that, right? Right. Um, there's questions so then of law question, and there's questions of fact, yeah. as we say. Yeah. 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 So I, it fails at both grounds. So just one, one last thing there, because I've been asked, like, what, what if I'm in Pakistan and locally they're holding prayer at the masjid down the road and I have cousins there who are wondering this? Of course, interestingly, none of them would actually go there necessarily, but I just ask, because I don't, you know, you know, very, right? But they're saying you have to go and you know, I'm hearing the adhan, etc. That's where you follow your conscience, right? Mm. Like nobody, no, nobody will stand on the day of judgment and say, well, <laughs> you know, I died and I left behind my kids and this and that. Why? Because I followed the local masjid. No, you know, we are, we stand before God, you know, with our, with our conscience. And agency. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. And so in that, in that sense that, you know, if you don't, don't you know, yeah. You know, and I, I can't judge the whole situation in Pakistan by any means, but it, it would appear to be problematic. I, you know, I would not, you know, we should not blame anyone. We don't know their circumstances and what they're dealing with. But just as a, you know, so we keep out the personalities, but, but as an issue, it's deeply problematic. Um, and if someone's in that situation where people around them, etc., you would be rewarded for discouraging people from going. You would be rewarded also for, you know, for if you feel it's the wrong thing to do, don't do it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, engaging in character assassination stuff is the the time spent doing that will be. There's a lot that we should be doing, right? It's raise awareness, right? Raise awareness. That, yeah. That's I think a lot more important than than sort of you know, slandering people and so on. Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely makes sense. So really appreciate. It. Well, we're coming up on two hours, and it's for me, it's flown by. It's been super beneficial. Uh, I'm sure our our listeners will, when they listen to this, it'll they'll feel the same way as Pervez and I, I do. I'm sure. Um, we, we typically close out by asking the um, the guest what they're working on, and I have a, actually a, a question just before that. You know, before asking you what you're working on, I wanted to touch on the idea of online education, right? Right now, we, we all are getting into this new world of online education. Our kids are taking virtual school um, uh, colleges. My dad's a college professor. He's teaching, he's teaching a university for the first time uh, online. But you were, you know, before we get into the projects you're working on, just want to touch on you being a pioneer in this space for a decade plus, even more so perhaps, before it's now hitting the mainstream, you you were in, in terms of Muslim education, online education. You started early, and I, I just before you talk, you know maybe you could lead us by talking about what 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 prompted you to head in that direction. What was the inspiration, um, and and what was that? I was told to do it. Pardon um, me. I started teaching online in two thousand and one. Um, oh, actually, wow. the this it was I was actually I was in the middle of biting onto a Big Mac when I got a call at a very unusual time. It was like past 11 at night in Jordan, um, McDonald's did home delivery. Uh, but oh, that's, another, of, that's another high-tech uh, yeah. thing that's also hitting so, mainstream now. Yeah, so this is 2001. 
So a few of us were like, we're missing like back home, whatever. So like, okay, let's do it late at night because so other people don't see us, right? So we we did a like a McDonald's party, not because any of us like McDonald's. We're all anti globalization, anti this, anti that, but all feeling quite guilty about it. Yeah. And literally, I take my first bite of my Big Mac, and I haven't had Big Mac for ages, right? And I get a call. And it's one of the scholars. <laughs> it was like so embarrassing. And, and he said, you know, there's a big need to teach online this and that. Oh, you, um, right. and so you're thinking the call is because you were about to take a bite of this Big Mac. <laughs> no, but you know, you're, it's something it, it no, tweaks no, your you conscience. Mean. Yeah, right? exactly. it's kind of tweaks your conscience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so it was by his advice so, that yeah. yeah. So there, but one of the one of the things is that. And there's a lot that's on offer all over, and there's some really good things. But, um, and many of us are in situations where, you know, we're, there's a lot of informal educating, et cetera. Many people would run Sunday school, et cetera. One of the things is that, you know, every, every medium has its challenges, but also its considerations, right? So for online learning as well, that, you know, people would do well. If they're in that situation, whether as someone teaching, you know, formal or informal teaching, but also with respect to us choosing, you know, different options for, you know, what we want to connect with in Ramadan or for our children's educational choices, that um, just be, you know, if you're the one educating, be aware of the medium and its considerations, but also if you are accessing okay this Ramadan I can't go to my local masjid or here or there then choose something that you can benefit from during the month right um, and likewise with children that you know, pay a little bit of attention um, there's also realities that all kinds of people are going online right and you know and especially with children because already even before Ramadan coming um, you know and I you know Alhamdulillah, I've been all, you know, working online for 20 years. I don't get into online debates or arguments. But there have been a few friends who are telling me I'm doing this and that. I have to sort of tell them, not tell them why. But, you know, there's people who are clearly should not be teaching other people's children and stuff who are, you know, just out there to take that, you know, effort that, you know, just check who, who it is, what are they offering and so on. Because just because someone is broadcasting does not necessarily mean that you should be listening to them, and our, our children are even more sense, uh, sensitive, right? Um, there's a lot of, like, you know, it's very convenient to have Qur'an class with someone in this country or that country, right? But you're leaving your children in front of a screen with somebody who's one-on-one -on -one with them, for example. You know, you're the parent, you have to do the due diligence, right? Um, and you, we don't think ill of people, whatever, but we take, we take caution. Right? We take caution, especially with our children, but also for ourselves. That yeah, it's an opportunity to to you know to learn online, etc. But um, does that that's one. The other thing is, if you're someone who you know in this month you want to connect with religious teachings, and I'm that there's a lot of excellent teachings available. But look at something that relates to where you are, like you know the you know um, where you are in your relationship with Allah, and what do you need in the circumstances that you're in. To improve in your relationship with Allah, whether it be spiritually or socially, right? Because there's so much stuff, and it's better that you know, like in a buffet, right? Uh, and my fa my my father who used to be part of the gastronomic society of Spain, so you know, most buffets are are awful. So you have to choose a buffet carefully, but don't try to eat everything all at once because you'll spoil the experience, right? So likewise, don't say okay. Seekers is offering 12 classes and Cambridge Muslim College is doing this and I'm going to, you know, pick something and just stick with it. It's much better than, than you know, because then there's so many offerings and you're just dabbling here and there because you reach yeah. the end of Ramadan and you've not experienced any growth. Yeah, right? it's, it's the same that we can say. I mean, we live in an age of content overload and I think that we're, we're, we're suddenly, or we're certainly seeing that even now, especially with this coronavirus going on where everybody's out there providing online content. So it's almost been this explosion I've seen in the last 
what, six weeks or so. Um, not to mention, like, or, you know, folks like yourself who have been pioneers in the field for decades. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of excellent opportunities, but Imam Abu Hanifa gave a beautiful criteria that what is religious understanding, right? What's fiqh? He said, fiqh is to know yourself what will count for you and what will count against you, right? Right. So my advice in terms of what should I, what should I listen to in life? So where am I at? And what, what can I take that will be for me, that help me grow in a, in a healthy manner, right? That will give me spiritual and social balance. Because there's some things that will just be overwhelming, right? Um, so, um, and alhamdulillah, it's, it's a big blessing because many, many teachers and others who otherwise were reluctant to be online, etc., are going online. There's opportunities. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, and there's some really good, there's re some really good children's programming, right? There's some, there's some bad programming. And I know I shouldn't plug someone else. There's one person. If you have, if you have children, uh, actually, even if you're an adult child and you want to just relax, um, there is a, an American convert storyteller. I've known her for two decades because she's, uh, her son, uh, is a world class, um, uh, 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 you know, artist, woodworker, um, uh, Miriam Mehdad Sinclair. She has a website and stuff. She's doing ch children's story time classes. I have not met a more brilliant storyteller. Oh, wow. Do you, do you know the and website or, or something? Uh, yeah. Yeah. But if you type Miriam Mehdad, M E H D E D Sinclair. Okay. Um, she's an older lady. Uh, I, I can send the link, but I, this yeah, no, no, people can look like, it up. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. But, but really, like, um, she's, uh, I mean, she used to be a storyteller before she became Muslim. She has an amazing story. You know, you can just read it, read about it. But really, I mean, stunning. She, two years ago, she came to our center here in Toronto. We had like 300 kids packing the place. It was a storytelling session that kids kept in more. It lasted almost hours. Just walking at the back, it was, and you know, to retain children's attention for three hours is like with religious content That's is incredible, feat. right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. but it, it, she and and she's just a, such a special person. I don't even remember. every time I go to Jordan, she always drops off some gift because I don't even re recall when I answer some religious questions for her like eighteen years ago. <laughs> She's grateful for it to this day. That's just so there. There's really beautiful things like that. So she's doing brief. I think it's like half an hour a day or something. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll definitely uh, check it out. We'll uh, definitely check so, it out. So, um, alhamdulillah. Yeah. So uh, uh, we'll, check, we'll, we'll check out her site as you record. But but uh, as we wrap, tell us where people can uh, find your site and where to contact you if if they need to. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, you know, I, I work um, at, at Seekers Guidance. So we have, you know, um, we have free online uh, courses. So we have an open course system now that we just deployed. So we have like about 180 courses now in a wide range of subjects and, and various learning streams. So we have those and we have a full Ramadan schedule because uh, we have teachers on five continents. So we have in 12 different time zones, there'll be different classes going live and so on. So there's quite a lot on, on offer. We have guides for Ramadan and, and so on. And, um, and you know, and uh, so that, that's the, the, that's the, the, the primary, the, the primary place uh, um, where both my courses and, and also I have some podcasts and, and stuff there um, where, where yeah. it can be found. People can that's, find you on Twitter. Uh, you have a social media presence. Yeah. Besides the, yeah, uh, the, my uh, first the uncle name, yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the uncle. So yeah, on on Facebook it's just my it's just you know, uh, my public profile is Sheikh Faraz Rabani. On on Facebook and Instagram it's just Faraz Rabani. Okay. I have my alter ego which is me. It's not my dad. It's not my uncle. It's Uncle Rabani. That's the grumpy uncle. He's 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 tweeting through Ramadan about his. Oh, is he? Okay, because so I thought you oh, mentioned nice. he was dormant. Because I I, I, I yeah, definitely he, want he's to. on and off. He's on and off. <laughs> but he he he's had because a lot of it's not actually me. I hear uncle things in like family conversations, right? So I'll, I'll share okay. them. I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm gonna start yeah, following we'll that be, account of yours we'll, as well. We'll be checking you out at Uncle Orbani, but more importantly on uh, Seekers Guidance.
That's and right. Been That's busy, a lot going on. Great site. Yeah. So we really and, and and please and please keep this up. Like you know, I've yeah, I, you know, uh, I sort of heard the first episode of uh, the Hughes conferences, but actually I was intrigued because what in the world does it mean, right? <laughs> but really, it's it's the and you know, and in this kind of time, it can be really challenging. But really, it's you know, you've you've enlightened, inspired, made so much. Of, you know, there's so many laughs. There's so many like so many beautiful things and it's it's something that um and i mentioned this before to pervez but but really you know do keep it up and and may allah you know uh you're you guys are hitting your hundredth podcast but yeah you know uh you know just stick with it because it's re really really uh very very uh, beneficial thank you so much i mean that's that, that's really inspirational. that's like a dua that i was going to ask you to make for us and, and that's even better so thank you so much for those encouraging words yeah. So, okay, Pervez, why don't you uh, take it away? Uh, yeah, sure. So thank you again, uh, Chef Faraz. It was just, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, like Omar said, two hours just flew by. Um, and uh, we do appreciate your time. I know it's getting late. Uh, we're getting to the uh, late night uh, in terms of uh, Toronto time. So thank you for uh, giving us your evening, as it were, and giving our giving our listeners your evening. Um, folks, as always, you can reach us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Um, find us on Facebook, uh, Twitter. Uh, and continue to engage us. We love hearing from you. And thank you as always for checking out our episodes. Um, we're hoping, you know, uh, we're, we're hoping that we're, we, we, we're, we're hoping that we'd be able to provide a couple of more episodes, um, in the month of Ramadan. We'll see how that goes. But, uh, thank you as always for listening. Um, we are recording via Zoom. So, um, as always, please do pardon any, uh, interruptions or any uh, sound quality issues. So we're, we're as uh, looking forward to getting back in the studio as you are. So, um, in terms of listeners. So thank you so much as always for listening and catch us next time on the next episode of the Peace Community. I like them.